Good evening. I'm going to get started so uh, Jason can bat clean up. Um, so um, thanks, BJ, very much. And uh, I can barely see you. i got to grow a little bit. <laughs> no, you're good. <laughs> it's great to see you. It's great to see uh, other friends. Father Michael, of course, has been a dear friend to our family and uh, spiritual guidance and everything else for, uh, for us, for our kids, uh, for a number of years. And we in, in uh, the Washington area were sad when he got transferred from our neck of the woods up to New Jersey to this neck of the woods, but it's just a treat for me to get to still see him sometimes. So, and of course, my wife Maureen, I already kidded him about this, but my wife Maureen is on his email list of these uh, daily reflections and thoughts, and um, I usually get it verbally from her at some point during the day, but when it's a particularly... Uh, I don't know, one that she really wants me to uh, digest, she'll forward the email to me, which I got today. So um, i got to go back and uh, further reflect on Father Michael's wisdom. But, um, but in any event, it's great to be with you all tonight and um, uh, delighted to uh, chat with you a little bit about uh, this upcoming election and uh, the, the sort of the dynamic that is, uh, that's been forming over the course of this uh, election cycle. And as you can see, I put uh, the title of this uh, presentation, What's Going On? So I'm very hopeful that you all are going to be able to explain to me at some point what is going on uh, in this election. Uh, maybe when we go through some of this uh, presentation, you'll be able to make sense of it for me. Because in the business that I'm in, I've got clients and friends and family members and everyone always saying, Mike, wh what is going on in this election cycle? And I tell them, Look, if I tried to make sense of this for you, I would be lying. So why don't you tell me what you think is going on, and we can share theories because this is a, it's a completely unorthodox election cycle. It, uh, so much of uh, conventional wisdom has been absolutely turned on its head. Uh, and, uh, you know, sometimes some of us who are, uh, do this uh, for a living and are, you know, as close to it as we are and, and kind of do it every day, um, it's, uh, sometimes you lose your perspective uh, when things go so completely uh, not according to uh, the way uh, sort of the so-called experts and the pundits um, uh, think that they're going to go. So um, I, I want to just walk you through some of my own uh, thinking and so, some of the facts and figures. I'm going to I'm a Republican. BJ didn't mention I, I was uh, am and, and was a Republican. Uh, uh, I served in the House of Representatives for eight years. I was a member of the Majority Party for six of those eight years. I served the same eight years as President George W. Bush. So I had the pleasure of serving with a president of my own party for eight years, and most of that time in the majority, it was, it was really enjoyable. And, and uh, my freshman term, my first term is when I was on that financial services committee with, when Mike Oxley was the chairman, and when we, we were taking on all sorts of difficult uh, financial services industry uh, challenges uh, during that time. Uh, but, um, but in any event, uh, very happy to be in the private sector now and, and trying to help folks deal with some of the uh, laws and regulations that we were involved with uh, with implementing when when we were when I was in office, so so I'm going to just uh, move on to this slide. So first of all, it's important I think as you sort through the election, as we learned, uh, most of America learned. We had a credible civics lesson back in uh, the year 2000 that uh, the popular vote uh, is interesting but not relevant to determining the outcome of our presidential elections. It's really this electoral college map which is uh, key to determining who ends up uh, being elected president and. You can take a look at this map. This is a, just gives you an idea of uh, where things stand pretty much right now, although there's been a, a lot of volatility in this race. Uh, we saw a lot of volatility in the primary elections uh, on both sides uh, of the aisle, and we've seen a lot of volatility in the general election uh, since the summer. And uh, right now, based on the preponderance of polling and the data that we have, you can see uh, the red states are the states where Donald Trump is ahead or is likely to win. Um, the blue states are the states where uh, Secretary Clinton is ahead or is likely to win. Uh, and then we have a few gray states which are uh, sort of uh, uh, still sort of up in the air. The, the Electoral College map is largely stable. It has largely been stable for the last several uh, election cycles. There are essentially, th there, th there have been basically 40 states that we sort of know how they're going to how they're going to vote. Uh, and then there are, generally speaking, 10 states or so which can be in play. 
And that's where the candidates spend all their time. That's where the candidates spend all their money. Uh, and that's where they try to uh, sort through the, uh, the outcomes. Uh, we all remember in 2000, Florida was sort of the center of the universe with their recount and whatnot. Uh, in the last couple of election cycles, Ohio has been uh, sort of the center of the universe and you know, the key swing state. Last election cycle, I remember specifically Ohio, Virginia, and Florida were the kind of key states that everybody was focused on. Virginia seems to have fallen into the Democratic camp. It's been kind of moved from, it used to be a really red state, it's kind of moved to be sort of a purple state the last couple of cycles and seems to be moving further more into the blue column uh, right now. Um, Florida still remains pretty much up in the air. Uh, North Carolina, interestingly, uh, used to be, again, a red state, but it's become increasingly uh, purple. Uh, Nevada, the same thing, a lot of, uh, lot of new uh, residents in Nevada, huge uh, new influx of population, uh, many Hispanics moving into Nevada, which has changed the dynamic of the election, uh, the electorate there. Um, interestingly, I was telling BJ before, uh, the data, as we look at them in this election cycle, the, the, the electorate is so volatile that if your data is three or four days old, it's, uh, it's outdated. Uh, and these, when we put these slides together just a few days ago, um, we didn't take into account both Pennsylvania and Colorado, as you can see on this map, they're both blue. Well, the, the recent polling from the last week or so is actually drawing those two states uh, into a very, um, uh, more of the toss-up category, um, which is amazing because they've both been pretty blue states in presidential cycles for the last uh, two or three elections. So it's, uh, you know, it, if, if Colorado continues to tighten, if Pennsylvania continues to tighten, bodes very well. Uh, for Donald Trump. I mean, if Donald Trump wins Pennsylvania, he's going to be elected president. If Donald Trump wins uh, Colorado, he's very likely going to be elected president. So um, we've seen a real shift in the last couple of weeks um, uh, from, uh, you know, when Donald Trump in, say, August and beginning of September was really sucking wind. He was really struggling. Um, uh, Senator, Cl uh, Senator Clinton, Secretary Clinton has had a tough couple of weeks. Um, and we've seen the polling really uh, kind of swing back. And uh, states that really should have been in her column, like Florida, she was, she was probably 15 points ahead in Florida a month ago. Now Florida's in a, in a toss-up category. So um, it's, uh, um, it, it's, it's, uh, some of these states, it's because of changing demographics. Some of these states, it's because of other things that are going on there that um, is, uh, is kind of moving them into different categories. You can see, um, even if, but doing the math, right, uh, eventually Electoral College is about math. Um, even if Trump wins those three gray states from our previous slide, he still doesn't get to the 270 electoral votes that he needs to get to. So even if those three states go for Trump, and right now all of them are trending that way, um, uh, it still doesn't get uh, Trump to... Uh, to 270 electoral votes. So he's got he's to do something else. Um, and I'll just point out, you can see up in Maine, th th there are these um, interesting quirks and changes that are going on in the electoral map that make it difficult to predict. You can see Maine as a blue state, right? Well, Maine is also the only state in the nation that awards its electoral votes by congressional district. So Maine has four electoral votes. They have two congressional districts, and they have two U.S. senators. So they have four electoral votes. So the the winner of the statewide uh, ballot in Maine will get the two Senate electoral votes, but the two congressional electoral votes, one for each congressional district, will be awarded based on who wins each individual congressional district. In one of the congressional districts in Maine right now, Hillary Clinton is way ahead. In the other district, Donald Trump is actually way ahead. So it's quite possible that Donald Trump could win one of the four electoral votes in the state of Maine. So there, there are a number of these different quirks and and changes that could that could really start to mess with this math. Um, correct. This slide assumes that Pennsylvania and Colorado are blue and would remain blue. So the fact that those two are becoming competitive uh, would would suggest if if all those other uh, predictions hold true, this would suggest that if either Colorado or Pennsylvania flipped to Trump he would be elected president. But what this, I think, highlights is that the Electoral College is largely, right now, kind of um, stacked in favor of whoever the Democratic candidate is. And I don't mean that it's stacked in an unfair way. I just mean the, the, the performance of these states over the last several cycles has, has uh, you know, we've, we've seen uh, 
for, for Donald Trump to win, he needs to win all of the so-called Romney states plus. He needs to win all the so-called McCain states plus, right, if you're doing the math. So, um, you know, if, uh, if uh, uh, so, so Trump needs to flip states that had previously voted for President Obama to be able to win. Um, so uh, that, that is how you end up uh, with, with that math. Um, you can see why 270 electoral votes, because um, there, are, there are 538 electoral votes up for grabs. There are 100, you know, their electoral votes are determined by the number of senators and members of the House uh, in each particular state. So uh, you can see there's 100 electoral votes based on the Senate. There are 435 electoral votes based on the House. Washington, D.C. has three electoral votes. Um, so even though they don't have representation in the, in the Senate, um, they do have a delegate who serves in the, in the House, but who's not a member of the House, but who's a delegate. Um, so that gives us a grand total of 538, which means 270 uh, is what you need to win. 269 to 269 could be a tie, in which case that goes to the House of Representatives. That'll be a whole new drama that uh, we'll talk about some other time. Um, but 270 is, is how you win. So last night, right? How many people watched last night? Wow, that is virtually 100%. Uh, that is, uh, that, uh, I mean, they were supposed to be, I mean, we were supposed to break all the records last night. I haven't seen any of the uh, ratings, uh, the sort of snap ratings from last night, but who was that? 70? Okay, that falls way short of some of these predictions that people were talking about 100 million people are going to be watching the debate, but 70 million is still a big number. Um, and, um, you know, so it's interesting. It's, I mean, I watched as well. Um, my own uh, sense was that, uh, you know, uh, Clinton had a clear strategy. She wanted to get under his skin a little bit. She wanted to tweak him a little bit. She wanted to uh, kind of throw him off his game a little bit. He's a sort of a bombastic fellow. And, uh, she's, you know, we've, we've all seen uh, times when he's been sort of thrown off his game and kind of loses it, loses it a little bit. Um, and that clearly was part of her strategy to kind of throw him off and to be the calm and cool and collected and pleasant, um, you know, recipient of all of his attacks and charges and to look more presidential than him. I think she, I think she, my own sense is she succeeded in that. Um, uh, not only did Secretary Clinton, I think, succeed in that, um, I think Trump missed a lot of opportunities. Um, I was saying this to BJ before. I mean, as a guy who has been, not on national TV, but as a guy who's been through lots of debates with opponents um, and, uh, you know, through a lot of debate preparation and watched a lot of debates as well, um, you know, when uh, you're going to have certain opportunities uh, in, in, in a debate and you're going to have certain times when you're playing defense. You're going to have to play offense a little bit and play a little bit of defense. But you have to sort of know when you're going to play which. Um, and you have to be prepared to parry an attack uh, that you receive with sort of uh, in, in a dismissive sort of way and then to pivot and to go on offense um, rather than what Trump did last night, which was when he got attacked, he would spend all of his rebuttal time repeating all of the attacks that Secretary Clinton uh, lodged against him and explained in a usually less than coherent way why it wasn't a very good attack, um, which sort of leaves you just left folks sort of, me anyway, left sort of wondering, um, not sure if that attack was true or not, but um, it sort of just sort of muddled the, muddled the waters a little bit, um, but it wasn't, uh, I didn't think was particularly effective. The real question, frankly, is does it matter? Um, and that is something that we're going to be able to determine over the next few days as we see some of the data come out of folks. Some of the initial data that I've been seeing today is that it didn't particularly matter. Um, we know that um, the country is very deeply and very narrowly divided. I mean, the national polling, which we'll talk about in a second, has, has, is, has been very, very closely uh, contested. Uh, these numbers are very, very close. And the, 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 the key also with a lot of the Trump support is that it's pretty steadfast. It's, uh, it's pretty solid. And there are, I think there, his support has shown, certainly through the primaries, that uh, his base of support is pretty tough to throw them off. Um, their support for him. So it's, um, th that is really going to be the question that I'm going to be looking at as, we, uh, as these next few days go by. Is this going to substantially change the, dyna the dynamic of the race? My guess is it might not, uh, even though as a Republican, it was painful for me to watch this, the, the uh, 90 minutes of the, of the debate last night. Um, I, I think um, even though it seemed like she was much better prepared, uh, she had much better tactics, 
uh, the question remains wh whether it's going to actually um, change uh, the polling data. Underlying all of this, and, and I've sort of referenced this before, but the, 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 uh, the, to me, the unique aspect of this year's election over previous uh, presidential elections is we have the two most hated uh, candidates in our country's history uh, running for president. Um, you, you, they both have historic, I mean, if, 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 you, if, if anyone said that they're going to run for president and they had an unfavorable rating of 55 or 60 percent, you, you would be toast. You, you wouldn't have a prayer. You, you, there would be no way you could win an election. Um, yet, we have two candidates who both have those numbers. So one of them is going to win, which is remarkable. Um, and whoever wins is going to be the least popular new president in our country's history, um, which is really something. And I'll, I'll touch on this later uh, as it, when, it, when it comes to sort of governing a little bit. But that's really what's driving this campaign. And um, uh, we've seen some of the shifts in the, in the poll numbers over the last couple of weeks that I, that I referenced. Um, the reason Donald Trump had a bad August and a bad beginning of September was because it was all about him. The race was all about him. He was saying things. He was doing things. Uh, there were attacks being lodged against him that he wasn't answering very well. Um, and that's when he really was starting to go in the tank. The last couple of weeks, the campaign's been all about Secretary Clinton, about her health problems, about uh, you know, denigrating uh, Trump supporters at large swaths of the country in very you know, dismissive terms, uh, the deplorables. Um, when the campaign and the, and, the, and the news was all about Secretary Clinton for a couple of weeks, what did you see? You saw Trump's numbers go right up, and now he's uh, you know, doing quite well, and it's both in the state polls and in the national polls, doing much better than he was. So, I mean, those of us who've been in this business a little while knew at the beginning, when you have two candidates that have unfavorable ratings this high, the winner is going to be the one who uh, successfully makes the campaign about the other. So if this campaign ends up being largely about Secretary Clinton and her flaws, Donald Trump's going to win. Uh, but if Secretary Clinton can effectively make the campaign more about Donald Trump and his flaws, then she's going to win. Um, one of the reasons, uh, you know, it's, it's um, amazing that, uh, you know, when you look at the two candidates on paper, you'd think extremely qualified candidate versus, according to conventional wisdom in previous races, a candidate who is completely outside the box, right? So in many ways, uh, the conventional wisdom might be, well, gosh, you know, Secretary Clinton is extremely, you know, on paper, extremely qualified. Why is she having such a tough time? Well, one of the reasons she's having such a tough time is because uh, the, uh, most of Americans believe the country's heading in the wrong direction, which is really interesting because what we've seen is President Obama's personal approval ratings actually climbing this year. He's up over 50 percent. He's 55 percent approval in in a number of uh, uh, surveys that I've seen. Um, yet, at the same time, you have these different um, uh, polls, uh, data that have come out. I've asked people, you know, is the country on the right direction or the wrong direction, going in the right or wrong direction? People overwhelmingly feel like the country is going in the wrong direction. So typically, those two questions um, parallel each other, the, the personal approval ratings of the president and whether the country is going in the right or the wrong direction. In this case, we have them going in different directions. Um, and this is one of the reasons why Secretary Clinton, she's the party in power. Um, she's representing the party in power. She, it's very difficult for her to separate herself from President Obama and, and, and the policies that uh, people feel like are the status quo right now. So um, th this makes it uh, very challenging for her. So um, even given all of the, uh, some of the dynamic that I've described, um, Trump could still win. Um, there, there are lots of reasons why they're you know, he, he shouldn't even, I mean, uh, one of the things she was um, uh, said on a hot mic uh, that she thought was a private comment was she said, you know, last week she said, uh, you know, I, I should be beating this guy by 50 points. Like, what is going on? How, how, am, I, how am I tied with this guy, essentially? Um, there are a lot of her supporters, a lot of, I mean, plenty of folks that I talk to in the sort of political world who are scratching their heads going, how is this guy even staying on the same stage? with her based on lots of different factors, including his sort of sometimes outrageous things that he has said or done over the course of uh, you know, many years, uh, and some of the things he's said and done over the last several months or weeks. Um, but um, I think what that 
what what that doesn't take into account, and and it's a lot of folks who kind of live in the bubble of Washington D.C., frankly, or or Manhattan, um, that in the country there's this um, incredible uh, desire for change. Um, it's uh, I'll tell you on uh, election night at the New Hampshire primary, I was up in New Hampshire on election night. And um, I was uh, Governor Christie in New Jersey is a friend of mine. I was helping him with his campaign. I didn't go so well, but um, I was up there that night. And I and I'll never forget seeing Trump win. He won two to one over the second place finisher. I think it was Kasich. Um, huge win. I mean, I, we all kind of assumed Trump was at, by that point was going to win New, Ham- New Hampshire, but he won so big, and it was the first time it really dawned on me. Um, there are a a ton of Republican primary voters who. Um, typically fall into certain categories. These are ideological folks, typically, who are motivated by certain issues, certain values, um, and vote on those values. Um, Donald Trump's candidacy, personality, history should have been completely antithetical to many of those Republican primary voters. Uh, Yet he was winning tons of them, and in big, big numbers. And it dawned on me that night, I thought, you know, there are a lot of folks, uh, Republican primary voters, who have decided that these values, these issues that they typically vote on, who, which are not con- positions that are not consistent with Donald Trump's history, um, are deciding that they, they are willing to put those things aside that they typically use for their criteria to vote on. They're putting those things aside in order to vote for the guy who's most willing to blow up the entire system. That was a sort of a revelation for me that kind of dawned on me that night, and I'm a little you know, I'm part Irish, so I'm a little slow and, um, you know, live in Washington and, you know, just didn't have a feel for how, uh, what was going on in the country. And it's become very, very clear now that uh, this this desire, this feeling of alienation for um, the institutions which have been governing us, um, are they're, that, that they're failing. Um, it's also historically difficult for the same party to win three con- con- consecutive uh, elections. We saw that with uh, Reagan twice and, and his vice president, George Bush. We saw that in the 80s. But the economy was humming. You know, you had uh, Reagan was enormously popular. There were all sorts of things going well in the country. So it was, that was a bit of an anomaly that Bush was able to, to win uh, a third uh, consecutive term for Republicans. But it's, it's pretty, um, pretty un, uh, uncommon for that to happen. Clinton's unfavorables that I've mentioned is, uh, uh, you know, are extraordinary. Uh, the only reason Trump is in this is because her unfavorables are so high. The only reason she's in it is because Trump's unfavorables are so high. Um, and then, of course, uh, we talked about flipping one state. If one of these states flips, if Colorado or Virginia, Pennsylvania, if one of these states uh, flips, um, you know, the math could, could, could certainly be altered. Um, you see in the, in the uh, national polling, I, the national poll numbers to me, I, I, I'm usually pretty dismissive of them unless they show a big trend because ultimately the national poll, the national, you know, vote count doesn't, doesn't matter. Um, but to see uh, a Bloomberg poll, to see a Los Angeles Times poll where Trump had been behind by three, four, five, Eight points in some in some instances. Now he's ahead or tied, uh, you know, or ahead by one, ahead by three, ahead by four. That's a that's a that's a shift beyond the, the margin of error uh, in this data. So seeing that these polls of, over the last um, week or so, uh, seeing that uh, it, it's true that Trump Trump could actually win, and you're seeing some of these key states are 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 tightening. I I mentioned Pennsylvania. I mean, Secretary Clinton should be running away with Pennsylvania. Um, she's not. Uh, she should be running away with Colorado. Trump is actually ahead, uh, according to some uh, data. Uh, Virginia, she, she was ahead by 15 points uh, in Virginia about a month ago. Now she's ahead by uh, six, according to Quinnipiac. These are major shifts. So we're not only seeing the shifts in the national poll numbers, we're seeing the shifts in some of the state polls as well. Um, what does that mean for, uh, for Congress? So, so we talked about the, the presidential race. We'll talk about Congress just briefly, and then I'd uh, love to, uh, after uh, Jason's presentation, answer some of your questions. Um, so the, uh, in the House, uh, you know, it's expected that uh, probably um, uh, Republicans probably lose a few seats in the House because we're at a historic high number of uh, Republican House seats right now. So it wouldn't be surprising to see uh, Republicans lose a few of those seats. Um, and in the Senate, where Republicans have a 54 to 46 majority, um, they have a very unfavorable map uh, this year, uh, Republicans do, 
uh, with many, many more seats. So six years ago was a great Republican year. So six years later, you're going to have a lot more seats uh, up for grabs, uh, including in a number of these uh, 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 t targeted uh, presidential uh, races. So in states like um, uh, New Hampshire, in states like, um, uh, well, Missouri, not as much, but Florida. I mean, there are a number, Ohio, there are a number of key battleground states in the presidential contest that also have key Senate races going on and tight Senate races. So the conventional wisdom over the last year or two has been clearly the Democrats, they have a favorable map, they are going to win back the Senate. Um, it's probably, it's certainly still probably more likely than not that uh, Democrats win back the Senate. Um, but it's not at all a certainty that it was maybe a year or six months ago. Um, a couple of reasons for that. One, uh, candidate, the individual candidates have done an extremely good job of separating themselves from Trump, of running their own races, of localizing their races, and not being caught up in um, what could be a vortex of anti-Trump um, sentiment. So there's, there's no wave, there's no national wave that seems to be forming right now that would sweep out uh, otherwise popular uh, Republican senators. Um, uh, and another reason, frankly, is Trump isn't cratering yet. He's, uh, he's, he's ahead in some polls, he's competitive in many polls, so he hasn't yet been the drag, I mean we've got five weeks to go, but he hasn't yet been the drag on the Senate races that some anticipated that he would be. But you know, it's interesting. Um, there are a couple of Senate races, a couple of uh, states, Wisconsin, you see Russ Feingold here uh, waving in front of the flag. He's a Democrat running to retake his Senate seat in Wisconsin. Um, uh, in Wisconsin and Illinois, where there's a Republican running for re-election in Illinois, um, those two seats are, most folks think those are gone. Uh, for Republicans. I think the Democrats will win those two seats. Harry Reid's seat is an open seat in Nevada. A lot of people think Republicans actually win that seat back. Um, so th there's a little bit of a trade right now in, in seats that may flip. Um, but then there's, you know, Marco Rubio is doing better in, in Florida for the Republicans. Rob Portman is the incumbent in Ohio is doing very well. Um, Richard Burr is in North Carolina. He's hanging in there. He's, he's uh, probably going to win that race. So Kelly Ayotte, who's uh, pictured here, is in New Hampshire. She's in a very tough race. Pat Toomey is a Republican senator from Pennsylvania. He's in a very tough race. So it's possible, it's possible that Republicans uh, keep a, maybe a 51-49 majority. Um, it's possible that Democrats end up with a 51-49 majority. It's also possible that we end up with a 50-50 Senate. Um, which is really interesting, and it would be even more interesting. We had a 50-50 Senate, actually, when I, was, when I was first elected. That's when we had Dick Cheney running up to the Hill to break ties all the time in, in the Senate. Uh, the Vice President, of course, the President of the Senate and breaks ties. So if you have a 50-50 Senate, you're going to end up with a lot of ties on votes where the Vice President has to come up and break the ties. So if, if Secretary Clinton wins and Tim Kaine, a current senator from Virginia, is elected Vice President, uh, then there will be uh, Governor McAuliffe, who's the governor of Virginia, will have to appoint a successor to Tim Kaine, who, and he'll clearly appoint a Democrat. He's a Democrat. He'll appoint a Democrat to, um, to, to be a uh, placeholder for a little while. Uh, and then there'll be a special election in 2017 to determine who is going to fill the rest of that term of Tim Kaine's t uh, term in the Virginia, uh, in Virginia, one of Virginia's Senate seats. So it's possible that if you have a 50-50 or a 41-59 uh, uh, Senate, and Tim and Secretary Clinton wins the election, and Tim Kaine becomes the vice president, that special election in 2017 could determine the, the control of the Senate. I mean, there are some permutations here that can get crazy. So. Um, as, I, as you see here, the, uh, uh, the, the Republicans are likely going to keep the House. They have a large majority in the House right now. They're probably going to lose some seats, but no, nobody believes, nobody I know believes that the, they're actually going to lose the House. Um, there doesn't seem to be a wave kind of uh, um, uh, developing that would sweep out lots of, uh, lots of House folks. So um, with that, um, we'll look at uh, what next year bodes, uh, what, what bodes for next year. Um, you have, you're going to have a very unpopular new president. Uh, you're going to have uh, a closer uh, Republican majority in the House. You're going to have a very close majority, one way or the other, in the Senate. Um, you have, you have uh, Republicans in the House right now already talking about trying to impeach Secretary Clinton if she's elected president. Um, you have um, 
Democrat, many Democrats that I talk to are, are um, they can't even fathom the idea of Donald Trump, Donald Trump actually being elected president, and there is no way uh, that many of these folks will um, give him the time of day and be willing to work with him. So um, the most likely scenario right now is utter gridlock in Washington uh, next year. Um, if you think we've had some gridlock the last few years, you ain't seen nothing yet, um, and that's quite possible. Part of my naive optimism um, thinks to myself, well, you know what, Donald Trump is not an ideologue, he's a deal maker, right? So if he's elected president, maybe he finds a way to work with Democrats and gets them to the table and they actually get some things done. Another part of me thinks, you know, Secretary Clinton, when she was in the Senate, she actually worked quite well with Republicans. I actually worked, a bill that I wrote uh, that became law, I needed a Senate sponsor and uh, she was my Senate sponsor. You know, she gets attacked for not writing any bills that became law. I think there were three bills that she authored that, that became law during her time in the Senate. One of them was my bill, actually. So it, it's actually law now. But it's kind of funny. She, she actually had quite a reputation for working with Republicans um, in the Senate and in the House. So part of me thinks, gosh, maybe there's this glimmer of hope where e either of them could work with folks on the other side. But unfortunately, with the... With the um, sort of uh, the, the deep divisions and the partisanship in, our, in each of our parties, you know, Republicans and Democrats are both being dragged to their fringes uh, these days. Um, that probably makes it very, very difficult to do. So on that great note of optimism, I'll close and uh, look forward to taking your questions in a little while. Thank you.